acquirer will want the acquiree to stay on because really the value is in the people. If you just meet with students of that caliber, and your ambition level, no, automatically goes from here to here. Yeah. And I think that confidence stays with you for much longer than any part of the education. That's one of the other things education systems don't teach you is how to convince. Yeah. And how to sell. Welcome everyone to Finance Forward, where we talk about finance, accounts, and everything that counts. Today I have someone super, super special. She's a mother, an author. She has gone to an Ivy League school. She's a CEO of a very large enterprise now, master storyteller. And she's actually someone we've looked up to when, you know, you're looking for inspiration. I have today with me, Ms. Radhika Gupta. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. I was a little freaked out because you said accounts. You said finance and then you said accounts. So a little nervous that this doesn't go down the account <laughs> territory, but thank you. So I want to start with a naughty question. Uh, um, oh this no. is something you've been asked a few times. Uh. Um, so, Radhika, I'm, I hope you have an answer to this. I, uh-huh. I, you might. Um, how many ping pong balls in a Boeing 747? <laughs> I still have not figured out that damn answer. Why? No, I have a question. Why would you want to fit ping pong balls in a Boeing 747? <laughs> Who would do this? Just to throw you off. <laughs> Why would you want to do this? The, the better one is actually how many pizzas would you need to cover the square footage of Manhattan? <laughs> <laughs> what about over there? <laughs> yeah, how many vada pav do you need to cover properly? Why would you want to do that? Who could hold vada pav? So jumping yeah. into it, uh, I wanted to ask you about time management. Mm. You do so many things. I want to understand uh, for a younger audience, especially yeah. who keeps grappling that uh, you know time is always a constraint. Mm. I know that you did two degrees. Mm. Uh, you got inside the prestigious Jerome Fisher program, which is. Mm. Actually, one of the things I want to speak about a little later. Yeah. But how do you manage it? Because you're running a very large enterprise also now. Uh, it's a really good question, I think. And, you know, ironically, in so many podcasts, no one's asked me this question. Especially now, because between being a mother and a, you know, CEO, and, you know, I don't live life just as family and CEO. I You know, I also have a World Economic Forum still going on. I'm vice chairman of Amphi. There are 10 projects I'm doing at any point in time. So I think time management is super important. One is I believe that most people have more time than they think they do. So, you know, when people talk to me about social media and they're like, how much, how do you have so much time? I'm like, yeah, I watch one less episode of Bombay Bay comes on Netflix. The second thing is I think it is important to have priorities. So I have very clear priorities. You know, for me, there is my work, there is my home, and there is a third space in life where I call personal growth. And I take on projects on that. So yeah. it could be Amphi Vice Chairmanship, it could be my book. And I, I actually live by a spreadsheet. So I have a spreadsheet where I list down personal priorities for the year and for the week. And I look at that spreadsheet every week. And then I just relentlessly say no to everything else. Yeah. And third is, you know, one of the things that is good for me is that I've learned to become reasonably efficient. I think... People underestimate, you know, how quickly you can get things done. There is so much help when you try to delegate. There is so much help by way of productivity tools, high chat GPT. You know, there's so much that you can do to be efficient. So I try to take decisions quickly and I try to be very efficient. I'm told I'm very fast with things. But that's the only way to get so many things done. We still end up getting a lot of personal time as well. I get a lot of personal time. You know, people will be surprised with the amount of time I spend with my son. I remember I was shopping in Ikea once. This is such a funny story. And I was with my uh, baby nurse. And while I was picking the pill, someone actually came up to her. And they're like, so we've seen her on LinkedIn, etc. And such a weird question to us. They're like, does she actually spend time with her kid? No. <laughs> Who asks that? I don't care. But I do. I get a tremendous amount of personal time. Most people don't know that I talk to my parents every night for half an hour a night. Oh, wow. And it's something I've been doing for years and years. And I think it's energizing, right? You know, when you come home after a long day, you've made tough decisions. There is stress. There's all all the stuff that happens in the office. But when you go home and you see your smiling one-year-old with his toothy grin doing something silly, you don't get emotional about things at office. And you come back to office charged up. You can take stress, but it doesn't emotionally hit you because there's another outlet. So I think it's very important. So for all the kids who are thinking that they don't have two hours of studying in a day, uh, she's doing a billion things. Please do take some inspiration. Put a spreadsheet, calculate your 24 hours, 
I think you, I'm sure you get to us to study. You know, my mother used to make these sheets for me. There were yeah. no spreadsheets back in yeah, our time. Yeah. I know I sound really old, but like I think since I was in seventh grade, because again I was doing so much, after I would come home from school, she would make these sheets and put it on my wall saying that these are the projects that are due in the next two weeks. This is today we'll work on this one, then wow. we'll work on that one. And so there was never any problem of deadlines. Because deadlines, I, I don't like. Deadlines stress me. They annoy yeah. me. So she would make this and plan it. And I think I continued that. So I want to also ask you about the early years at Wharton. Mm -hmm. You did uh, two degrees over there. Yeah. You got inside the prestigious Jerome Fisher program. You and Nadin Sabot. First of all, getting in that program, 60 or 60-odd 60 kids in the world get inside that program. You also mentioned that you got inside Yale. So can you tell us a little bit about how you prepped? Uh -huh. And you got a 95% financial aid as well. Yeah, I did. I did. Now... You know, I have seen college admissions, uh, especially because of my husband, Nalin, uh, much more closely now. He's helmed admissions for uh, India for then for many years. I've interviewed candidates and I went back to campus this time to receive an alumni award at, at Fisher. So I've seen kids today and I see myself and I have to say I was a very clueless kid then. In my time, the fact that I could even apply and study abroad. I mean, I was the first one from the family. So for me, this was really shooting the moon. I learned about the Fisher program and I said this in my award speech through an application form. Yeah. Today, everybody knows about the yeah. Fisher program and everything and they're prepped and they know what school they want to go to and what colleges and essays and they look so smart and they look so perfect and they look so curated. Like I was pretty clueless uh, back then and it was really my mother and me on a mission yeah. Um, and I, I remember applying to 14 colleges, which was a lot yeah. uh, at that point in time because I was a financial aid applicant. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Ivy League schools give very limited financial aid to overseas students. I was fortunate enough to get into the schools. I have realized with college applications, you know, today they're over curated. Yeah. I would almost say that. It's like the kids are perfect. They don't sound like 17 and 18 <laughs> year olds. And I think what worked for us then is we were authentic. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I tell every applicant to an Ivy League school that of course you have to be a damn good student. Of course you have to work hard on those essays. But there's a certain amount of authenticity that needs to come. If you don't enjoy doing social work, don't do it to tick the yeah, box. Yeah, it yeah. shows people can see it through really this. Yeah, yeah. You know, there was once an application we read where a 17-year-old said, I am a hedge fund manager who's wow. generated 65% returns a year for the last five years. There was someone who was applying who tried to disprove Pythagoras' theorem. <laughs> and, you know, his alumni interview ended up being someone who was a professor at ma or math. Mad. <laughs> so I think a little bit of authenticity in the college application does well. Um, and I think that that's, that's what worked. Um, my early years at Penn, I think, if, if that was your question, were fantastic. An Ivy League school or a school of that caliber is a new world, especially if you have not been exposed to that. I think the classes are great, but what is greater is the environment. You just meet with students of that caliber and your ambition level no, automatically goes from here to here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You start thinking of working with the best in the world, studying with the best in the world. And I think that confidence stays with you for much longer no. than any part of the education does. So Nadin sir also uh, said that uh, Radhika would be uh, and he, and I quote him he, he said that you're a typical D DPS RK Puram girl I am. who will say that uh, I have not studied I am going to fail and she will turn up in the top of the class. <laughs> uh, yeah that's probably true. <laughs> um, I yes I think part of it, uh, at least in my college days, was in inherent lack of self-confidence. Um, part of it, I have to say, I have to respond to this, was arrogant guys. Because, you know, as a woman in computer science, you're, you're often in a minority. Um, and often these guys come to you, and just because they've taken one odd coding <laughs> class, right, they pretend as if, or they at least act as if, they're going to ace everything. And, you know, you just have an inherent lack of like, okay, I have no hope. So there's no point showing off because I don't really know if yeah. you're going to do well and then you end up doing well. But I think some of that DNA, by the way, still continues. Uh, I do believe it's better to under-promise and over-deliver, even, even as a CEO. When you're interacting with your boards or when you're interacting uh, with your bosses uh, and promoters, 
I do think it's a little better to under promise and over deliver. Is it true as an investment professional also? Someone asks me, "What's the market yeah. going to give you?" Which is a common question. I'll say ten to twelve percent, and people will look at me and be like, "You're undershooting." And I'm like, you know, it's better to have expectations of ten to twelve and get fifteen rather than have expectations of twenty and get that. So I think part of that DNA continues. So I'm. I really want to get inside forefront because mm-hmm. I found that to be one of the most interesting things. You, I, I know you went. You went to McKinsey. Mm-hmm. You went to AQR. Yeah. You know, one of the two bigger companies in the in the world actually. But I would. I want to speak more about forefront because I relate more to it. Mm-hmm. You bootstrapped the company right from serving tea to getting. Uh, and you know, we've done that. We've yeah. actually done that. Yeah. Um, serving tea to your clients and uh, ensuring that you get paperwork done. Yeah. Academic to Mahim. I did it in Bandra Court. You did it in Mahim. You live in a. industry which is like heavily I live in, I work in the most compliant industry in the country yeah. but so when you started up you were young yeah. you, you you definitely took a lot of risk uh-huh. but i'm assuming naivety kicked in uh-huh. um so how were early days at forefront how mentally resilient were you everyone mm-hmm. thinks startups are very glamorous now yeah but it's incredible incredible detailing ground work right you have to run around uh-huh. be there for your five clients they are unreasonable and what not say yes to more things than you can actually promise so how did you do it i think startups are far more glamorous now i don't think they were very glamorous then and we were bootstrapped because at least at that point i don't know if it's changed now and asset management startup is not something venture guys fund i mean yeah, it's yeah. just not a business that, yeah. that gets funded so we were bootstrapped the problem with being bootstrapped at 24 is that if you're not taking money from your parents yeah. and you've had 3 years of work experience you don't have many savings yeah. left i think Nalin and I probably each had five lakhs in the bank account, and we were living in Mumbai, and we were not taking salaries for a few years. So, personal life was a nightmare. And I think, to be honest, and I've written this in my book, if there's anything that got to me the most in that phase, it was the personal aspect of it, which is that you know all your classmates have come back, and they're working for Goldman or they're working for McKinsey here, so they're earning wonderful salaries, and or they're children of family businesses which is you know often the case with people who studied abroad in in that era and you know when you were classmates at Penn or when you were in New York working you were all equal like yeah. you were all taking the subway living in a one bedroom apartment and going for dinner and then suddenly because you're running a bootstrap startup there's this huge sense of inequality so i think if there's anything that was negative about my headspace it was this my headspace with work in the first 12 months was very exuberant because while there was a lot of groundwork and gutter wrenching stuff i think the excitement to build then was very high it turned after 12 months you know when when the, i think the headspace was a lot more challenged after 12 months one of the good things is about me and the guys decided i would do a lot of this running around in terms of legal work etc is it because i've lived in so many different parts of the world I am naturally a little adaptable yeah. and resilient and I don't mind getting my hands dirty with stuff. I've seen my mother and father do it. I I mean I've seen them find creative ways to make things work in Nigeria, you know. Dad has served in such senior roles in government. So I don't get phased by some of this yeah. uh stuff naturally. I've seen that DNA at home and I think subconsciously it was very helpful for so one question to the education system. The education system doesn't really prepare us for the reality we face for the oh god first is uh, what are your comments on that secondly is how can someone prepare for actual real life you know so i have many thoughts on this for two reasons one is i'm the child of an educator my yeah. you know mother's a principal of a school i i have also been the product of many different education systems not only the indian one but an american one and an international one as i have grown up and you know before i give my thoughts because everyone's very critical of the education system i also have a lot of empathy from their educators i do not think the education system especially the indian one prepares you for failure sharing practical life skills like public speaking yeah. negotiating creativity etc i think international systems do a little bit of a better job uh, preparing yeah. you for that I think the Indian education system and you know Nalin said I was a product of DPS RK Puram and I have a tremendous respect for that institution but the system prepares toppers really well yeah. so if you are a topper, topper and you're topping the failed. class and you've never failed it works really well but if you're someone who's a little behind in your yeah. class or if you're someone with an untraditional skill set 
I, I think it's tough. But I read a statistic that if you look at, I think, 70 to 80 percent of engineering grads today, they're not very employable. Yeah. And I think we should ask that question. The ability to be employable. Employability, the, yeah. Yeah, the ability to be employable means that we don't have, what does the ability to not be employable mean? It means we don't have a practical skill yeah. set, right? So I think we should ask that question. So, I mean, I remember I went to a college for HR, college in mm. is popular. I did a program called Bachelors in Financial Markets. I thought it's going to teach me how to invest in the mm. markets and get ready yeah. and that, that, that. We taught me NSC, BSC and yeah. all the theoretical stuff. But it didn't teach me actually how to invest. Mm. So, you know, in our early days, I would I had a senior mm. who would, from 9 to 3, mm. he, would be, he wouldn't have lunches. He would just be on his computer and he'll be just looking at the markets and doing his Excel work. And I was working as an article at that point of time. I was studying my chartered accountancy yeah. as well. So he, he taught me how to invest. Uh, we, made, we actually made a course out of it. Experientially. Pulled a bunch of kids to put money in the markets. It was fabulous. Wow. You know, kids loved it. I still get people saying that. Huh. I don't think. I look, I went to the best finance school yeah. in the world. And I still don't think that taught me how to invest. Yeah. It gave me a solid foundation in corporate finance and accounts. <clears throat> yeah. That's another story. But I think I learned how to invest by investing. Yeah. By you making starting. mistakes, by starting through the years on Wall Street, through seeing 2008, through seeing COVID, through managing investment professionals, through running funds. So I do believe investing, like many things, yeah. is a bit, a bit of a battlefield sport, which is why... I always tell people, especially young women who are scared to start investing, I'm like, rupe lo aur shuru start karo. Yeah, just start. And don't worry about making mistakes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, th that's what we live by. Just start. Just start. Because, yeah, it's the same thing because you also started very early. I did. Uh, you started forefront at what, 24, 25? 24, yeah. Uh, I t and, and 24, 25, leaving a good job, starting up, stop. It really, uh -huh. giving up a lot of salary and whatnot. Just saying, In that era, it was especially tough because, as I said, I think today. Well, startups not very accepted that time. At that point, nobody no. cared. See, this was 2013. Yeah. This was like pre Ache Din, India shining. It wasn't a particularly good time to do anything. Markets yeah. weren't in a great shape. But also, you have to realize that at, at that point, you know, for a middle class Indian who's taken financial aid, gone abroad, made it, yeah. survived the recession of 2008, yeah. not got laid off, a parent's perspective of that child wanting to come back is not very high. Uh, and we don't come from business Absolutely. families, yeah. right? So there's no other safety net. Yeah. So and I understand that as a parent, I empathize. Yeah. We, I know you. You start with twenty five lakh rupees in. Yeah. The twenty five lakhs, two crores. Yeah. Uh, the third year was. Ten crores. I remember when we got ten crores and someone gave us our first institutional mandate. I thought I had made everything <laughs> in life. So how did you convince? I mean, saleability. Hmm. Let's talk about a little bit about sales and. Sales, because that's such an important aspect of life. God, I, I think everyone should be a salesperson for yeah. some point in their yeah. life. I think uh, that's one of the other things education systems don't teach you is how to convince yeah. and how to sell. I learned sales by doing it and I'm still learning sales. I think sales is like leadership. It's one of those things that you, learn you by can performing. keep learning for the rest of your life also. Yeah. I remember uh, Ramdev Akarwal had given me this advice early days in my startup. He's like, He's like, you're well-spoken, Radhika. Go on TV. I actually was on business channels four days a week and giving stock tips. <laughs> you can see the old videos of me on YouTube, on CNBC, and there used to be a channel called NDTV yeah, Profit yeah. at yeah. that point in time. So I would be networking with journalists on LinkedIn. You put yourself out there in every way. In every way. Uh, in every single way. And it's such important education because you learn how to speak. I remember my first few TV interviews were a disaster. It's still on the web. You can go look for it. Meeting clients, I remember at some phase, I think two, three years into Forefront, when we had distributors who would help us raise money, you still had to go meet clients. So I would roam around like Ahmedabad or I would be doing eight, nine meetings in Kolkata, chilling in Bada Bazaar, having like some random chat for lunch and just doing meetings back to back. Forefront kept growing. Yeah. So when did Needlewise happen? Like It always happened in 2013, 14, when we realized that we wanted to sell the business. Uh, look at a larger platform. Um, the Edelweiss journey took nine or 10 months because we had appointed a formal investment banker okay. for the process. See, selling a tech startup or a product startup is a little different from financial services because in financial services, and you'll see this in most deals, the acquirer will want the acquiree to stay on because really the value is in the people. Absolutely. So 
you have to be a lot more thoughtful, not just about valuation, but the partner you're going to work with. Yeah. And I always joke with Rashesh that the beginning I was like, I'm not meeting otherwise, they're too aggressive, they're too aggressive. And then finally we met and uh, it was like a meeting of minds. And uh, that's why I think well after the acquisition, it's worked. And you also became a CEO at a very young age. I did, yeah. Now, uh, typically, and you said this, that huh? in an industry of grey hair, <laughs> uh, where grey hair is... I have grey hair now. Yeah, but now you're also eight, seven years. Yeah, into I'm seven years, into, six years. Into, um, yeah. So, you sold your business when you were about thirty. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and for, it's ten years yeah. in Needlewise now, I think. Um, so when CEO happened, uh-huh. when you were young, one of the younger CEOs, obviously the management uh, recession thereof, they trusted you. But you know, how did you ensure that people around you? How how did leadership happen? Because obviously you had people, mm-hmm. folks who were younger. We started uh-huh. Zella at twenty three, and uh-huh. we always had that trouble. You know, we. Uh, Pratham and I would actually dress in formals and keep beards and whatnot because you know what when parents come to us and tell us that you know what we want to give you a check for our kids education yeah. we better not sound like 23 Correct. Years. so how did you do that what was the journey initially to be thrown into becoming a CEO of a much larger entity so one of the good things is you know and I, I will come to the challenges is a, at least in Edelweiss internally young CEOs have been very acceptable okay. uh, I'm not the first young CEO okay in the mutual fund industry and financial services at large, absolute anomaly. So I think there are multiple paths to it. One is the obvious one, you know, I had started wearing sarees, I think, by the time, <laughs> well before I became CEO, I just, and now I love it, uh, but then it was a sort of conscious decision to look older. I kind of have to admit that. Um, I think two things. One is that, you know, yes, all my direct reports were older than me, they're still older. I got a very good piece of leadership advice then uh, from my then boss. He was like, don't be in a rush to behave like a leader. Yeah. Because I was also not from the mutual fund industry. He was like, go into meetings and just listen. Yeah. Don't feel that I'm here, I'm the CEO, I have to add value. Yeah. And then don't even ask questions, just listen. A few months later, ask questions. Then add suggestions six months later. Ease you eased into it, yeah. Ease into it. Because we often come into this thing saying, oh, I'm CEO, everything's broken, I have to change everything. And it doesn't work. Um, and with time, I've learned. Like my head of fixed income, and I can say this publicly, Dawal, he and I are great friends. He's yeah. significantly older than me. He has so much more experience. But we have this incredible dynamic. And I respect him for what he brings to the table. And I think he respects me for what I bring to the business. And we have tremendous fights that no one intervenes in. And, you know, we make up what we have. A really healthy equation. The the other one I had a challenge was is, was in my industry because, you know, the gap is so wide. It's yeah. like 15, 20 years. So I really struggled with feeling out of place, you know, because everyone seems to know each other and all the distributors are also older and everyone seems to have that thing. So I think there you prove yourself with time and confidence. Now I, I still look different. I'm still younger, but I feel at home. Okay. And I have great equations in the industry, but that has come with time. So, um, one of the things you took the company from 100 crores, now mm-hmm. it's, uh, now in March I, re- I read, is well, it six, 1 lakh crore? Yeah, 6,000 to about yeah 1.1 lakh odd crore. Wow, that's 17 or 10. Uh, yeah. I'm going to speak a little bit about Bharat Bond, because uh-huh. I found that story incredibly interesting. Yeah. You you were at the right place at the right time. I was, sure. I was. But what did you, how did you make sure that the transformation in mindset of your people huh. and the beliefs Mm. Yeah, I mean, of course, everyone wanted to make it happen, mm. but how did you believe, make them believe that this is We had about 30, 40 people uh, that came in either through JP Morgan or were existing employees and great people who are still with us. And a lot of the hiring was fresh. One of the good things for me was I didn't come from industry. Yeah. And so you don't have that typical cynicism that industry people have. Ki ye to hoi nahi sakta, or, you know, if you are ranked 36, then you can't grow. My messaging has always been that in your head you have to think like a winner. In your head you have to think you're number one. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a very powerful state of mind. If you start thinking that I'm going to grow at industry, average, etc. You're actually going to grow at far less. Because mm. your body language droops, your state of mind droops. And you become far less. Nobody in life, like this, I'm also a student of storytelling. And one yeah. of the things in storytelling that you learn is that the villain has to be great. What makes Sholay great? It's a gumbar. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Have you seen a movie called L.O.C. Kargil? <laughs> yeah, of course I have. Yeah. Who was the villain? 
was like a bunch of random dudes in kurtas against 13 heroes it the winner has to be great um for a story for the hero to have a journey yeah. i remember when i did the girl with the broken neck talk in fact the gcs one yeah the gcs one which went viral later and actually we were 20000 crores in size then and actually said i want to run a 2 lakh crore mc we are not that far and yeah. so i'm saying you put a moon shot at least you'll get halfway to the moon Absolutely. shot there's no joy in saying and leading a team saying we're at 20000 five years later we're going to get to 25000 there's no joy in doing that there's no you know there's no story there's no saga so now you went from 6000 yeah. like you required jp morgan which also at that point of time you've mentioned in your book that it was something your your it was eyebrow raising in the industry yeah. but so tell me one thing starting up has always been difficult right huh. going from 0 to 100 crores is difficult yeah. but 100 to 1000 is not probably the most difficult thing but 1000 to a lakh yeah is just phenomenal that mm-hmm. a lot of people trusting you guys with a lot of money, money yeah and um you're still your 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 roots are still under promise over deliver you're still getting out returns no you're consistently doing yeah so and one of the best things one of the best products a pioneering product which you guys have brought in is the bharat bond huh? uh, etfs huh? what is the pressure of the of the job because the sheer size uh-huh. doesn't that get to you at any point in time because handling pressure be the student uh-huh. be the, as an entrepreneur at forefront or now it's uh-huh. just increasing by the day i think there's a lot of awareness of the responsibility again it's something i say in and out to the team and to myself that the biggest asset you actually have is not 1.1 lakh crores it's the trust of that many yeah. people and because i'm also a little known because of my speaking you know i will have individuals who will write to me who will say that you know i saw a talk of yours and i started an sip and you know for my daughter's education and god that's a, it's it's flattering but it's more nerve wracking than yeah. it is flattering so the responsibility that the brand carries is incredible and i think you know there's a word that is used in mutual funds which is mutual fund sahi hai yeah. but to live that sahi hai is really hard work every day i think we try to make sure that one we are selling products that we know how to manage we're managing them true to label so if you're buying toothpaste you're getting toothpaste and we're selling it the right way and if any customer complains which is why i'm so active on social media we are taking care of that as best as we can and we will make mistakes in that yeah. journey you know the investment business does not sell a product it doesn't sell lipstick it sells a promise yeah. of future returns and they may or may not realize right and even despite your best intent in this business you may have customers who are disappointed because markets were down 50% and maybe you were down 40% maybe you were down 60% despite your best intentions so communicating right is extremely important uh, in our business um so i think there is tremendous weight of responsibility in living that responsibility and one of my criticisms for the media has always been that at least in mainstream filmmaking you've always portrayed money management and financial very glamorous very glamorously and there are these fund managers who are wolf of wall street and dons <laughs> on yachts uh you know and you know they they've got all this and tell you people on this floor are, and most people i've seen in this industry are not like that they are actually mostly quiet nerdy people who feel the weight of responsibility yeah. on them it is much harder to manage someone else's money than it yeah. is to manage your own money i can be careless about my own money i'll leave it for 5 days in a bank account and not on liquid fund interest i would never do that with someone else's money yeah so how do you ensure that your team also handles pressure Uh-huh. because pressure gets to people up uh-huh. at the size that you guys are at yeah so how would you, and and you know what for a kid who's studying for <laughs> their exams uh, yeah. or for a for a person who's going for this interview for me who's interviewing for you for the first time pressure really does get to you how do you prepare mentally the individuals react to pressure differently i think uh, my my few thoughts on that is one both in business and as a child i feel it's important to have conversations sometimes those conversations are not very pleasant Yeah. But after that you get you like some it. you feel lighter you realize you're not the only one going through this situation. Secondly I think beyond a certain point comparison is very unhealthy. Of course we are all competitive we want the best for ourselves as Nalin keeps saying you know DPS RK pura mentality. A certain amount of competition is healthy beyond a point a certain amount of competition is also a little unhealthy. So I remember you know my son is going to this mother toddler group and two days ago one mother and the son is two months older than mine 
was like my son can speak so many words and you know he can identify and i was like to my son can barely say mama and papa <laughs> all the other mothers were stressed they were really stressed like her kids can't speak any words i was this mother claiming her kid can speak all these words this is unhealthy there's a certain amount of pressure that is nice when you cook a certain amount of pressure is needed to boil the potato yeah. naina pressure cooker beyond the point yeah it will explode good analogy so as a leader you have to find the balance, the balance yeah. of yeah running a pressure cooker effectively yeah. yeah as a young person and as self doubt creeps in for a lot of kids huh. because i've seen a lot more kids overthinking now yeah. having access to more information which is good and you know yeah. sometimes you obviously go beyond who are mentors you look up to and who's your do you have normally each of us has to create a tribe of personal advisors yeah uh beyond our parents yeah. and beyond our friends because parents saw a purpose but they grew up in a generation that was very different from yeah. the one the children are growing up in and friends are friends with friends you have these angles of competition etc etc so i think you have to find people that matter for the ceo they could be members of your board they could be friends in your industry they could be anybody yeah. right and i think even as you know kids for instance if there's a cousin in the family who's done well or you know that you look up mm-hmm. to that that person could be a, a mentor or an advisor or whatever you want to call it if there's a a parent's friend you know who you relate yeah. to and is perhaps doing something in marketing that you want to that person could mm-hmm. be someone so i think the world has become a lot more accessible by the way i have 17 and 18 year old kids writing to me for advice and periodically i will write back uh, because the note is compelling so i think you have to find your own tribe and construct it as soon as possible and i also believe most of us growing up have more access than we think yeah today you can reach out anyone to anyone on linkedin are you think of your own parents yeah. most of our parents have some sense of network absolutely talk to their friends talk to their network the amount of conversations i and even more nalan have had with friends children i think we don't ask for enough yeah as kids so be demanding be demanding yeah. be absolutely demanding right. so go out and reach out to their network easy enough i mean just reach out to anyone and everyone you know someone's going to for sure write back someone's going to for sure write back or follow up i think the art of following up is not there yeah yeah nobody follow follows up basic okay. principle of asking is only not there yeah. it's not what you say it's how you say it uh, so, yeah. it's when you say it it's how you say it there's a time to ask there's a way to ask there's a the way to handle being told no because that will also happen but I always say this that old Tata's ka hai na push dala to live jinga lala. We'll end with Bharat Bhot. Uh, that's very interesting because uh, I, I'm first in PTF, you had the government's blessing. Huh? Again, you were comparatively smaller yeah. against the behemoths, the mm. HDFC, the SBIs, and other companies at that point of time. You you guys won the mandate. It was literally creating a broader category of its own. Can you tell us a little bit about the journey? We know the result. but a little bit about the journey the stress yeah happening, i actually most people know about the bid and most people know about the result so very few people know about the journey even though i will be say it was mf and i am much more than bharat bond i think uh, we'll struggle to shake off the bharat bond tag because that brand has so, been you created a category of yeah, we it, was created, it wasn't existing before this yeah yeah we created a category we created a regulatory framework we worked with the government on one year to bring this to launch so i think what people don't realize is between winning the mandate and bringing the product to market the one year was the most grueling years of the six I, i've had uh, here um because in india in most businesses really the talent is between idea to execution yeah. and that is a very difficult yep. journey especially with a product that is co-created with government there's a lot of debate that happens so it took us 4 months to agree on finally what would be the product structure and it took us months and months to work with i think 17 18 ministries, 17, 18 ministries yeah. to get the approvals know, yeah. within a time frame within yeah. a time frame and <laughs> finally i think for me the biggest achievement was not when bharat bond raised the first money that it is but the day the union cabinet approved yeah. it uh because that is a real milestone you know yeah. uh and when fm i remember the citizen amendment act rule so come out that day i was told a press con would be happening with fm and a bunch of other people and i was like this is on ca etc 
and then you had honorable fm doing a 20 minute conversation on bharat bond that was an incredible so they believed in it also i think uh, our, our prime minister also had blessed it our prime minister blessed it in fact that day i was flying to delhi to work on the execution and when i landed in delhi there were photos of uh, bharat bond being blessed by the prime minister so it's an incredible uh, and that created a lot of trust in the people also obviously that people. created a lot of trust it created a lot of trust in the brand uh, and it gave the opportunity for a brand for the brand to just Take off, yeah. yeah. I mean, the best kind of marketing is literally word of mouth, and these are the best endorsers. All. Yeah, and the best kind of marketing is consumers trusting and loving something uh, that you built. So, you know, for for many people, it was their first pocket money investment. I mean, I hope it turns out to be really, really good. Uh, I think my time's up. Thank you so much for doing this one. My today. pleasure. We really manifested to do this podcast, th- and uh, if you enjoyed this, we'll probably come and this podcast takes off. I uh, I would love to. get you back for a part 2 and obviously Absolutely. uh more greer hairs but more obviously experience and wisdom at that time to share <laughs> great thank you thank you thank you